Press here at the Petroleum Club. My name is Ian Patton. I am the uh, consultant for and the uh, executive director for the uh, newly formed uh, Long Beach Reform Coalition. And uh, we're very excited to be here today, but uh, we have to start out with uh, a little bit of bad news because before we get to our town hall event on term limits later this evening, uh, we wanted to discuss with uh, members of the press the ordeal that some of our coalition members went through. To just give you a very quick background on the Long Beach Reform Coalition, we are a political action committee which was recently formed to unite the watchdogs and civic reformers and neighborhood advocates in the city. And we are a coalition of eight organizations. And we together have decided to wage a no on Measure BBB campaign. Measure BBB is the uh, charter amendment to extend term limits in the city of Long Beach from two terms to three terms for the mayor and the city council. Now while that is the focus of our campaign, this election cycle, I can say that uh, all our members are opposed to the other charter amendments and they, uh, after we jointly wrote the sample ballot argument against Measure BBB, members of our coalition volunteered to write the against arguments for other sample ballot arguments, for other charter amendments. And those arguments ended up, uh, uh, because of an overreach of the city, being having these people taken to court, average citizens taken to court by the city of Long Beach with 24 hours notice. And I'm going to step aside and look at that, uh, and allow uh, two of our coalition members to speak. We have here Juana Valle, who is with the organization People of Long Beach, and Robert Fox with Kono, the Council of Neighborhood Organizations. And we're going to start with Juan, uh, who will give you a timeline of events of how this occurred. Thank you, Ian. So, as some of you already know, yesterday, September the 5th, at 9.30 a.m. at the Los Angeles Superior Court, a judge approved the revised ballot arguments and rebuttals submitted in opposition of ballot measure AAA and ADD. Now, as part of the timeline, let me go back a little bit to some of the issues that we faced. Uh, this started back in June uh, of this year, when it became known by Mayor Robert Garcia that we were mounting an opposition to his measures, specifically measure BBB, as Ian mentioned. Mayor Garcia came to my home on July the 3rd after the funeral service of fallen firemen, uh, and he spoke to us about his ideas, and he was unsuccessful in convincing us. So he offered us seats on a city commission. He also offered to continue the conversation, however, never reached back to us. Now this maneuver is nothing new, and it became more evident to us as we got involved of how the city was trying to silence people during the three uh, city-held uh, hearings on these charter amendments, or these charter uh, these measures. Uh, how the city's tactics are skirting the law in order to barely make the timeline. Let's say, for instance, the first one, I think it was at 5 or 1. The second one was at 2.30 in the afternoon, and the third one was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Times when hardly anybody could make it. Now, the third one, with the coalition and everybody that got involved by that time, we were able to show in force, of, you know, and we filled out the, uh, the, 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 the council chambers in opposition to not just one, but every single one of those measures. We weren't heard, and we were pushed aside. Finally, the attempt to intimidate us, us as a coalition, by hiring a highly paid law firm known as Best, Best and Krieger against us, and ironically, with our own money. They attempted to infringe on our right to free speech. We were outmanned, outgunned, and penniless. But we are still here, and our arguments will still be read by the people. So let me uh, follow through with the, uh, the time of, of events. So on August the 17th, we submitted our arguments against the four measures to the Long Beach City Clerk's Office. On August the 22nd, 
I received a phone call uh, while in vac on vacation in Alaska with my wife uh, from a Bill Priest who started talking to me about their opposition to some yeah, language in the measures. Along jumped in Amy Weber, uh, city attorney with the city of Long Beach, and uh, again, continue to talk about it. The conversation or the, uh, uh, the phone conversation was so difficult to understand because out in that area of the country, there's very little um, access to, to good quality phone service. So anyways, I asked that they email us their questions or their issues because I really couldn't hear and she never did. On August the 27th, Mayor Garcia writes, um, and the argument writers, in support of the, of the uh, redistricting and city auditor ballot measures, retained their outside counsel, BBNK, to file a petition of writ of mandate in downtown Los Angeles Superior Court. On the August the 28th, we attended that hearing. It was attended, we attended the LA Superior Court hearing, and the attendees were Robert Fox, uh, Ian Patton, and myself. And, um, and we were handed, at that moment, I was handed the complete summons from BBNK. On August 29th, it, but that same evening, the August 28th, so the timeline is so quick. On August 28th, when we came back to Long Beach, we started working on the, on the argument uh, language. We started crafting the new language. We started working in Ian's office. We stayed there until, really late at night. We were able to submit that language on the same Tuesday, August the 28th to BBNK for their review and to the city. Uh, by August the 29th, the next day, uh, we request, they also requested an additional language change as part of the agreement or negotiation. They requested that we also change the rebuttal language, which was never in the first uh, uh, summons. It was not even included in it, but they said, well, if you want to deal with this, you have to change the language in the rebuttal as well. Well, we did it. We changed the language in the rebuttal. We submitted that language to them. Uh, by the 30th, we had a telephone conference with the attorneys and with the city of Long Beach, uh, including our city attorney, and uh, we, you know, came to an agreement uh, of the language and we were good with it, uh, at least as good as we can get. Uh, so anyways, by the 31st, uh, we received the stipulations of our, of our executed uh, documentation, and again, by September 5th, we have an agreement. And that's sort of the quick synopsis of the timeline. And I'll hand this over to Robert Fox so that he may add to this as well. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Fox. I'm Executive Director of the Council of Neighborhood Organizations. Um, obviously, I was a party to this overreach. I was completely offended. In the 40 years that I've lived in Long Beach, the city has never hired attorneys to sue anybody who wrote a ballot argument against something. Common sense is they give you a call on the telephone and say, you know, we have some problem with this little language here. Do you think you want to amend that? And we've been very gentlemanly about it, and we come to an agreement. Not this time. This time, it was the mayor's directive, be very clear about this, it was not anybody else's directive, it was the mayor's directive to hire legal counsel, bam, out of the blue. Well, there's two reasons for this, because it's about timing. The city council at any time could have had this hearing in June and May and April. They knew what they wanted a long time ago. But they held it at the last minute because it means that you have to rush the timing because this was a special election added on to the November 6th ballot. And the county has timelines that we have to meet. So given no time very much, um, the first time Juan heard of their dis displeasure was the 22nd, I believe. And they, could, they had time to call us on the phone, but they didn't do it. They just decided that they were going to intimidate us. And frankly, I was extraordinarily offended. I'm personally offended. Number one, they did not give us the correct information to write ballots for arguments from. They have withheld that. So on the, on the day of the hearing, the only kind of argument that we got, the backup material, had already been shifted and changed. So I'm writing an argument without all the documentation that I need to do it. I'm not a stupid person. 
generally we're not stupid people in Long Beach. We know how to read stuff, and if we don't agree with it, we know how to write a ballot and argue against it. So on many fronts here, it's just been a really messy situation. It's clear that the city council wants their term limits expanded. And yet they're, they're calling us out on misleading language. The ballot says they are strengthening term limits. How misleading do you think that is? They're not strengthening anything. We have two terms and a right in candidacy. Only three individuals in the entire history of Long Beach have succeeded in a right in candidacy, and they've never gone for more terms than that. So it's sort of like a specious argument that they're somehow fixing some sort of like a loophole. But the way they're doing it is by intimidation. And I don't like this tactic. You know, so as a council of neighborhood organizations, we talked about it, and we had a unanimous vote against all of these ballot uh, amendments to our charter. The charter is our governing document in the city of Long Beach. It's really important. When you start changing the definition of the city auditor, when you start, and this is the weird part, they're making the city auditor choose commissioners for the ethics commission. The auditor is supposed to audit all commissions and all committees and all departments. How do you do that when you appoint the commissioners? There's such a conflict of interest in that. So it's either very ill thought or very intentional, one or the other. So we're here today to announce our opposition. You know, we have come together finally as the Long Beach Reform Coalition, and we're inviting other groups across the city of Long Beach to join us. And we're asking for simple things. Transparency in government, number one. Participation in our government so we're not shut out. We don't want to show up at hearings and then be refused to speak. The mayor promised them, don't worry about those hundred people that are in the lobby who can't get in because of security. Everybody will have a time to speak. Well, after 15 speakers, he cut off the dialogue. And by the time the hearing was done, there were two people still trying to get into the hall. If that's the kind of government you want, then don't say anything. But we're here, I guess, myself personally, I'm here to say I want a different kind of government. And that's why we have united together. Thank you very much. Before we take questions, I'm just going to lay out a few other uh, basic aspects of what happened here. Um, there's, two ways, there's two ways to do this with uh, sample ballot arguments on ballot measures. Uh, there's the normal way, which has always been done in the past, where citizens apply to write these arguments, and they're accepted, they write the arguments, they submit them, and there's a period of time for the public to call into the city clerk, complain if they think anything is inaccurate, and if there are any issues, the city attorney is supposed to review the text only for accuracy, not for political content. If there are any accuracy issues, and everyone makes mistakes, uh, then there's a time period for the city clerk to relay that to the writers so they can make changes. All that should happen in an administrative fashion. This shouldn't ever end up in court. And it has never ended up in court before, so long as anyone can remember. And we have members of our coalition who can remember back many decades, and they don't remember this ever happening before. So the question is, why, if there were issues, number one, why were they not notified in the normal time period? It says here, and I have the pleading that was filed, that on August 21, 2018, Robert Garcia, Laura Dow, Rex Pritchard, and James Foster, and those are all the writers of the pro argument, informed the city of Long Beach elections official that certain statements in the argument against measure AAA were incorrect and needed to be modified or deleted. And it says the same thing regarding DDD. Well, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, as far as we know, and, and we have this directly from Juan and Carlos, you heard it from Juan, he specifically requested an email with the lines that the city attorney found problematic. He requested it multiple times, him and his brother Carlos, and they received nothing. So why did they wait out the normal time period and then put themselves in a situation where they were forced to go to court because at that point only a judge could make changes to the text? And I think the answer is that they wanted changes beyond accuracy. 
They wanted to hit the nature of these arguments, and that is a direct offense against democracy and free speech, and that's why we're having this press conference. So I want that to be very clear, yeah. and... Uh, Can we talk about the $40,000 they threatened us with? Well, I, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think they specifically threatened, but it's implicit that any, anyone who's going to court can seek legal fees if they win. And so, you know, Juan and Robert were put in a situation, they were never served anything, they received 24-hour phone notice, and they had to show up into court, and they didn't have time to get legal counsel, they didn't have time to raise funds to defend themselves, whereas the city of Long Beach has an infinite amount of funds available. They have outside counsel, Best Best and Krieger, very expensive law firm available at any time. They're beck and call. And they had to respond, and if they lose, there's the chance that the city could potentially have sought legal fees and put them in debt, not only them, but the other people who signed on to these ballot arguments that they wrote into a great deal of legal debt. And that's an amazing catch-22 situation that no average citizen should be put in. Again, people make mistakes. There were a couple mistakes in these uh, arguments, but they're supposed to be given the opportunity to correct them. And it's not supposed to end up in court where you feel like you have no choice now but to acquiesce to the city that not only wants to change issues of accuracy, but wants to tone down the political content. And I have a few examples here. This is, uh, this is one change that they, this is straight out of their pleading. It says a redistricting commission controlled by the mayor has the power to control the district boundaries, <clears throat> excuse me, not in a manner that follows the natural flow and composition of neighborhoods, but in a way that can influence who gets elected. Well, uh, there was an issue there in terms of control by the mayor, and, and we have no problem fixing that, adjusting the language slightly, but they wanted to take out the part about uh, any insinuation that a redistricting, a redistricting council might not do their job properly. Well, shouldn't a citizen be allowed to speculate uh, based on the, the nature of a, of, a, of a commission, whether it's going to do its job properly or not, do we have to assume it's always going to do its job? Another example of this is uh, in the email from the attorney, the outside counsel Best Best in Krieger, uh, he says a change he wanted is the mayor and city management, this is on the auditor uh, uh, text, the mayor and city management could potentially then bury any report, record, or document. That was written by Robert Fox. The attorney said, unless exempt from disclosure, um, let me go down. He says, this language simply insinuates illegal conduct by city officials, as that would be required to truly uh, bury a report. Well, Mr. Fox said, could potentially. Could potentially. Is he not allowed to say that? Is he not allowed to imagine that uh, uh, the city bureaucracy isn't going to be perfect and uh, following the law all the time. There have been plenty of examples of the city breaking the law, public officials breaking the law in the past. So the idea that, that we can't talk about that is the real outrage here. And uh, I've got a bunch more of these, but I think I'll, I'll let those go so that we can take questions and uh, Robert and Juan can uh, give you some answers to any questions you have. I have a question. <coughs> It sounds like that old phrase, uh, using a lawyer like you use your six, gun, six guns. Were you ever offered, I'm, I'm asking this question from the standpoint that historically these things were, these matters were settled uh, with the city clerk and the parties involved and no lawyers, no court. So that precedent was broken and the mayor took advantage of our treasury to hire a very expensive law firm. In that context, since this break in precedent took place, do you feel that you should have been offered a lawyer of equal caliber to represent your side of this I'm by the city? I'm gonna take this answer because um, I'm the kind of person who does my homework. So I got notified at 9.30 in the morning that we were going to court the next morning at 8.30. Long drive to Los Angeles. So the first thing I do is I called Monique, our, our city clerk. 
And I said, what is this all about? Can't we just negotiate this thing out? You know, we always have in the past. And Monique's answer to me was, it's out of my hands. The mayor absolutely will not talk to you. Click, end of story. So we had no, there wasn't going to be any conversation whatsoever. And we had to somehow get ourselves up five o'clock in the morning to, you know, drive to Hill Street. Um, you know, it's an over LA trip. Hill Street, right? LA <laughs> Hill Street, you know, excuse me, it's right in the middle of, of nowhere, you know, like downtown Los Angeles. Parking is not easy. Um, the judge was very nice, you know, and we could have fought this thing, but here's the problem. The city has attorneys, these guys were, you know, $50,000 attorneys. And the fine against us, if we did not mediate with them, was $40,000. You know, and I'm concerned about Juan, and I'm concerned about the other people that wrote these ballot arguments. I don't spit for $40,000. But I have to be aware that other people maybe not are in the same position. And I thought that was such an onerous threat to put above somebody who's only trying to do their civic duty. That's what democracy is all about. And trying to check with the, the city clerk for some sort of clarity was a very telling thing to me. On that point, my question about should the city have provided you with an attorney, had you had an attorney of equal caliber, <clears throat> do you think that you would have made concessions that you otherwise would not have wanted to make and take it the whole distance? I think that if we had had a, a, the same quality caliber attorney, we probably would have thought about it twice. And I know Robert had even issues with, you know, even appeasing them with uh, some of the language that we actually had to change. So if we had had an attorney by our side that was of the same caliber that could have advised us on the correct manner of doing this, or, or if there was a, a better way of doing it, yeah, it would have been great. We had an opportunity from the 28th, I believe it was, to the 31st to respond to court with a brief. And then it was going to have a court hearing on the 5th of September. In answer to your question directly, Stephen, yes, if we had attorneys, it would really have helped. I was the one who was the holdout. I just was infuriated because they went way beyond accuracy of language. It went to the idea of you can't say anything that's potentially bad news. You know, for me, in, in the argument about the auditor, when they removed the languaging that said she will get immediate access, which is warrant power, they changed it to timely. They didn't tell anybody in the ballot about it. There's no backup material about it in the ballot. But I know the difference. If you only get timely response from the city of Long Beach, they're com complaining that, oh, well, that doesn't mean four months. I challenge anyone here to go to the city of Long Beach and not ask for something that's small. I mean, if it's small, you get it in an hour. But if you're asking for a document like we did in the land use element, it took four months. If you're auditing an entire department, that's a lot of paperwork. That's a lot of financials. So timely is not unreasonable to think that it might be four to six months. The reason we don't give that time right now very simply is this, the auditor has warrant power right now. She can walk into anybody's office and get that paperwork. It reminds me a lot about what happened with um, Michael Cohen's office. The feds didn't give him a two-hour warning. They just walked into his house and walked into his office, took what they wanted, and they had warrant power. And so they got accurate information that had not been shredded, hadn't been whitewashed, hadn't been doctored, hadn't been altered. That's the point of warrant power. I'm not claiming that Laura Dowd would ever do that. But we've had other auditors. I remember Gary Burroughs. I remember Bob Franke. I've been here a long time. So the, the job description of the auditor, what we're arguing about, is the position itself. And how do we protect ourselves? Because they are the check and balance on the city. And so our languaging was about possibilities of problems. And how do, that's why the founding fathers of Long Beach wrote these documents so carefully. Because they, they were anticipating the what ifs. And that's what we wanted to preserve, and they would not let us say the what ifs in our argument. I think I think that's an abridgment of my First Amendment right, frankly. The writ indicates it was filed on September the 5th. Were either of you in court on September the 5th? I was in court on September the 5th. Okay. Was, there, was there an agreement stated in open court on who would pay attorney's fees? 
it, it was, yes, and it's on the document as well that uh, yeah. it, it, the city abated the, the fees. Yes. Yeah, so each, yeah. each party would be uh, liable for their own uh, attorney fees, but since we had no attorney, our fees were not. On something else you mentioned, could you elaborate a little more on that discussion you said occurred at your house with Mayor Garcia? Go for it. Yeah. So on July 3rd, uh, Mayor Garcia, uh, at uh, my invitation, came to my home to discuss our, uh, our stand in against Measure BBB. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. And uh, so he came over to the house uh, that day. And we talked about it. He tried to convince us uh, that you know that it was a good thing to eliminate the loophole that he called, uh, but it didn't work out. Um, on his way out, he offered uh, seats in one of his boards. One of the boards? Oh, uh, yeah. Did one for Cardinals and one for me. <laughs> Did he mention which boards? No, he didn't mention any board at that moment. No. But he did say, you guys are, are doing good, you guys are out there, we like those kinds of people, it would be great if you could, uh, you know, become a board member. Did he say anything like, if I choose you, you'll do something else? No, he did not. Did you, did you assume a quid pro quo was going on? Well, I, I assumed that uh, if we had, well, I figured that if we had said, yeah, that would be great, how can we, where do we get started, uh, it would be sort of, uh, yeah, quick pro quo. I mean, why, why would we want to bite the, the hand of the guy that's giving us a, you know, a spot somewhere? That may or may not be good anyways. But. Any what, other questions? What was the, as a family man on vacation with your family, and throughout this process, how did the intimidation factor affect you? What what went through you as a human being, knowing that this financial burden could be imposed on you, you and your family? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I was uh, spooked uh, because uh, I didn't expect something like this to happen. Uh, at least not not to me. So yeah, I was I was spooked, especially when one attorney calls and starts asking me something which I really couldn't understand very well on the phone, and then all of a sudden another attorney jumps into the phone. Uh, so I thought that was really strange. Two attorneys on the phone again, you know, to talk to me about something, uh, which you know wasn't 100% clear, and that's why I asked that they please send me an email and send me a letter with whatever it is that they need us to do. And then immediately Carlos, uh, well, a couple of hours later after he, he looked at the situation and thought about it, he sent an email to the city attorney's office requesting uh, clarification as well. And we're still waiting for that clarification. But, you know. In, in other words, the next meeting, thing you heard was that there was a writ of mandate at your front door. That's right. So on Monday, so I got back home Sunday uh, because I knew on, on Monday we had to submit the rebuttals. Uh, so I came, you know, so I, I, I was working on getting the paperwork finalized on Monday morning and I received a call from uh, an attorney from BB&K. I wasn't able to respond to the call, they left the message. A few minutes later she sent an email uh, letting me know that something was happening the next day. I didn't know what and that's when I started making the phone calls to, to the rest of the team to figure out what was going on. Uh, yeah. I had one last thing about these legal fees. Um, I've been told that when the BBK attorneys gave you the final stipulation to sign off on that they did not waive attorney fees and you had to ask that the city provide that waiver to you. Is that fact you had to go back to them that's and, and, and say as part of this? That's correct. That's uh -huh. correct. Though. So we received the, the writ. Uh, uh, and it was distributed to all of us in the team, Ian spotted that, that issue. Because we had just had a conference the day before uh, concerning that, and Ian uh, responded to that. Do you, do you uh, feel that that was an actually impose a, 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 file, a financial burden on the coalition uh, well, I'm as not punishment for what, uh, what they want to continue? I'm not going to speculate about the motivation. I just know that uh, I was part of this uh, conf settlement conference call along with Robert and Juan, 
and uh, we discussed on the call that attorney's fees specifically that each side would bear their own legal fees would be included in the language of the stipulation that we were agreeing to and when we received it it was missing and we had to then press them to do what they said they were going to do. Uh, this sounds to me like it's a, very possibly a constitutional issue uh, on your free speech. Uh, do you think that the uh, coalition would be open to suing the city for uh, for curbing your right to your right and the coalition's right to free speech? Well, well, I can answer for the coalition. We we just started this coalition a few weeks ago, so we don't have a massive war chest to pay lawyers at this point. Maybe someday we will and uh, we can readily uh, seek out a, a white shoe law firm like the city has on, on call for them. But uh, we're not in a position to do that yet. We are focused on our campaign and that's where all our resources have to go. I'm going to add one more thing uh, which is um, there's another aspect to this. Uh, <laughs> Robert Fox was accused of uh, some misleading language in uh, his uh, argument against the, the auditor amendment. And I think you should just briefly detail the fact that uh, you were going based on a draft of the ordinance available to the public, which was not actually the ordinance. Well, when you're asked to uh, draft an argument against, it's incumbent upon the city to give you the languaging of what the ordinance actually is. You know, we went to the hearing, the clerk had a digital copy you could download, so that's what we were downloading. And we didn't hear any change in the hearing from the city council on anything. They said, well, we don't really like this, but we're going to let the citizens vote on it. So we didn't expect any kind of a change in the languaging. I noticed the one change, they had timely and responsible, they knocked out the word responsible. So you know, I'm pretty clear you know, about what things happened. But there was no language that they were disagreeing with. So when I said that they had um, taken out certified copies as a requirement of the city auditor, they had already done that work. I'm the kind of person, if you tell me something that's, that's wrong, I just say, great, let's correct it. You know, I'm an honest Long Beach citizen. But that's not what happened here. What happened here was a vicious, authoritarian taking of citizens' rights to participate at any point in time. The city clerk, the mayor, the city manager could have picked up that phone and said, hey, we have a problem here. But no, instead what they used was intimidation tactics. And I'm sorry, $40,000 is a lot of money for a lot of folks. And I think it's pretty awful for the city of Long Beach to this is the first time in the 40 years that I've lived in Long Beach that the city has threatened people for trying to participate in the electoral process. We always are asking people to write ballot arguments against. It's hard to get people to do that. You know, so squelching that difficult process means that in the future, nobody's going to be wanting to write these ballot arguments because they're going to get sued by the city for $40,000. There's a consequence to doing these things. And that I, you know, either the mayor is completely clueless about constitutional uh, consequences, or we're in a whole different age. And I don't like it. I like an age of honesty and truth and just let's talk stuff out. Here, here. That's where I'm at. <clears throat> Sorry. Mr. Foster, let me ask one more. I, I, I don't want to dominate the questions, but I was able to obtain a document package. I don't know if it's an accurate document package, but I noticed in the package that after each of the, uh, the three meetings, if there were any language changes made, there was a document in the next package that showed those changes. That's correct. Now the change that you were referring to where a document originally said no hard copy. That was the that was the revised copy that we went to the last hearing with. 
But in looking at the document package, now. It, it, it was my perception, and I don't have any way to approve this until I get an accurate package of documents, but the package that I show does not show that the council at their final meeting voted on a change. No, they didn't. Okay, so they didn't vote on the hard copy thing. No. So after the fact, that language was changed. That has to be illegal, doesn't it? You know, I'm not sure when it got changed. Nobody was there from our coalition to see it. But usually, obviously, we're dealing with this council right now. Things are done behind the scenes, behind the doors. And I guess, you know, I had called Laura Dowd, took an hour and a half conversation with her. Somehow behind the scenes, without documenting it in paper, they had decided that they still needed to have certified copies of all contracts from the city of Long Beach. I support that. So, but what they did, they didn't tell the public that they'd inserted that. There was no, there was no, um, well, hey, here's new, new news. You know, this is what we're voting on now. So we didn't get an updated copy even at the time of the hearing. When it was voted to be put on the ballot, it had to have been in writing before you vote on it to put it on the ballot. And that's what we didn't get. So when we were asked to write the rebuttal, the only documentation that we had is what we thought was what was voted on in, in, in the hearing. So we were surprised to find that after the fact, oh no, you're arguing the wrong thing. Well, that's my point. When the council made their final vote to adopt these amendments as written, that hard copy language was not in it. So the council voted, it should have been over, but later on it turns out there's another change after the council well, voted. Isn't that the, illegal? The way they normally do this, I mean, just, I hate to be so boring, but you know, when you're making amendments in council, you can get a friendly amendment from the third district, and one from the fifth, and one from the sixth, and the city clerk writes it up, and the city attorney vets it and says, okay, so now when you're voting on this particular thing, we're adding on this clause, and this clause, and this clause and they document it and it's there in front of the council. That did not occur at this hearing. There were no additions, there were no subtractions, there was nothing that anybody had to write down. So the only presumption is that the documentation um, was set in stone behind the scenes someplace and unfortunately somebody made a mistake and didn't give it to everybody. So, uh, and again, we were writing blind, doing the best we could. I think that what you're gonna find on the ballot uh, this time is the mayor basically wrote the argument against and the rebuttal against because it certainly is not my language. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's not my language. I would have said something completely different. But that's the state of the city right now. So if we want to change it, we're going to have to work together. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm just going to say one more thing, which is. Uh, the entity we need answers from on this is the city attorney's office. It's my understanding this was all handled through uh, city attorney Parkins' office, and we would love to get those answers. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>